So uh, this book is uh, one of the most important uh, output from the uh, uh, ADBI annual conference 2022. And uh, it's also a part of ADBI uh, book series on Asian and Pacific Sustainable Development series. Uh, edited by Professor Rohini Pande of Yale University and me. And I'm very happy uh, that uh, this book is finally out uh, as a, a freely downloadable open access book. And then I hope it will be uh, read by uh, many, many leaders uh, in uh, developing Asia and also global uh, development cooperation uh, network or community. Uh, I'm uh, pretty much uh, confident about uh, this book's uh, popularity. Uh, it's just uh, out, but uh, within a masses, I hope, uh, within masses, it will gain the popularity. That's my hope, and, but I'm a bit uh, uh, confident about that. Uh, for at least two reasons. One, the first reason is that uh, uh, this, the, this book uh, deals with very you know, timely uh, topic. Uh, it's an excellent choice of the topic. And the choice was made by the four editors, uh, uh, Dina Azkarieva, and uh, Dil Rahat, and uh, John Ban, and uh, Ishin Yao. And then initially, uh, when the editors began calling uh, potential or possible authors, the, they, had, uh, they were struggling in getting uh, positive responses, uh, maybe because the topic was really emerging hot issue. Uh, and then the, because of that, uh, the academics, well, not few, relatively few academics were ready to write or speak about it. But uh, I think the, uh, the first keynote speaker at the annual conference, uh, Professor Richard Baldwin, uh, said something like that. So it's a really hot issue. And then this book will serve as a the uh, very good uh, early uh, reference for the researchers who will dig this issue deeper and wider in the near future. And then another, another reason why I believe and really hope this book will be popular in the future is that uh, it is written by really, really excellent, distinguished, world-renowned authors, including the two speakers uh, with us today, uh, Alicia uh, Garcia Herrero and uh, Richard, uh, Richard Thor, and together with, uh, uh, oh, sorry, the, these two uh, authors, right? And then um, they are really, uh, you know, insight, they made a really insightful argument in the book. And thank you very much for uh, making uh, time in very uh, busy schedule, in a very busy schedule to join us today. Thank you very much, professors. And uh, Alicia, I thank you for another reason. Uh, the another reason is that you are, otherwise you gave me in Bali, uh, Indonesia last year about uh, uh, G7, uh, engagement group called uh, Think7 Japan. So I'd like, i really happy to uh, report to you that uh, ADBI has uh, hosted uh, Think7 Japan uh, very successfully. And then the uh, T7 Japan and uh, its uh, G20 counterpart, uh, T20 India, uh, uh, collaborating uh, closely and then uh, with the help of the Indonesian, uh, and the Brazilian, and of course German and South African colleagues, uh, we are successfully rebuilding 
the global think tank community. And uh, I hope that you will join us or already joining <laughs> and then uh, more and more in the future. And back to the, this book on the uh, global supply chains. Uh, I think the, these authors, uh, uh, you know, uh, authors of the books uh, include other, you know, great distinguished uh, authors like uh, David Tara, uh, Inma Crada, Martinez Zarzoso, and uh, Cynthia Rosenzweig, and uh, uh, David Ravorde, and uh, Robert Elliott, and uh, Kim, Hua, uh, Kim Hua Tan. Thank you very much, uh, these authors. Uh, unfortunately, they cannot make it today, but uh, I hope uh, they are also happy uh, with this uh, publication of this book. And then additional reason why this book will be popular is uh, uh, today's participation of the Professor Craig Wilson. Thank you very much. Uh, he is a real expert in the uh, supply chain value analysis. And uh, also he is the uh, uh, editor-in-chief of the economic analysis and the policy. Are, am I correct? Uh, my memory sure. is too short. <laughs> Not from this year. <laughs> Until last year, yes. I see. I yes. see. So I think your presence uh, itself is a booster for this book. Thank you very much for uh, making time in your busy schedule to join us. Uh, so I uh, really uh, look forward to the fruitful discussion, panel discussion by these three uh, panelists. And then uh, also I look forward to uh, the active participation of the other participants in the Q&A session. Uh, I stop here, so thank you very much for kind attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dean Sonabe-san. Uh, we are indeed very excited of this book to be delivered across the world to share the significance of building supply chain resilience. Now, let's move on the next part of our webinar, the panel discussion. The panel discussion consists of three sessions, each presented by experts to discuss the topics covered in the book, plus a 15 minutes Q and A session for the floor at the end. Each, party, each panelist will have 10 minutes to present. So please pay attention to the time. We have a timer here to remind you automatically if the time is up, your presentation will be concluded. Now, we'd like to invite our first panelist, Professor Clevo Wilson, a professor at the School of Economics and Finance at Queensland University of Technology in Australia. And uh, Professor Wilson will, uh, will be addressing the global supply chain production of final agriculture products and food security, which is covered in part two of the book. Now, please join me. Welcome, Professor Wilson. Now, the floor is yours, Professor Wilson. Are you ready? Yes. Thank yeah, you. Let me, yeah, I'll, I can use slides, right? Yeah. Okay. Having a small issue with the slides. Sorry about that. Professor, could you click slide show? Yeah. Yes, uh, I'm having a problem here in uh -huh. enlarging it. Okay. Here it is. Okay. Oh yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, sorry for that. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, very briefly about global value chain production of final agricultural products, 
and food security and ask the question and look at winners and losers uh, and by uh, final agricultural products here i mean uh, food products that are ready to be consumed um, first before i start i thank uh, uh, the adbi for the opportunity to be part of the book launch and congratulations to the editors and authors for this timely book so um to start with uh, let me uh, uh, um, let me freezing here okay global value chains uh, i start by saying that global value chains are now a dominant feature of world trade basically it encompasses developed and developed world uh, the whole process of producing goods from new from raw materials to finished products is carried out and where it is cheapest and where quality is reasonable also uh, uh, what's interesting is uh, the production of food products that is ready to consume is undertaken almost in the exact manner in which the production of an industrial good takes place i will il illustrate this with an example a little later uh, different countries producing portions of the required inputs in this process is now commonplace. Further, uh, I would like to argue that the emergence of global supermarket chains have largely contributed to the acceleration of global value chain production. Now, uh, this slide basically shows how an aircraft is manufactured in the 21st century. Boeing obtains various parts that go into the production of this aircraft. Uh, there are at least 10 countries involved. The purpose of this slide is to show how the sourcing of various parts happen and how the same approach is applied in the production of a final uh, food product. Now, this is my example here. Uh, uh, I take a sachet of lentil soup as an example. There are hundreds of such products, if not thousands. Now, if you look carefully, uh, one of the striking features is the price. Uh, Australian dollars, 269, right, for 400 grams. And it says product of Thailand and also the use uh, before uh, November date is 2024. And as you can see, uh, there are at least 11 ingredients that go into making this soup. And uh, Thailand could potentially produce all the ingredients, but companies would source it from the country where it is cheapest and quality is reasonable. So based on the gravity theory, the company has to consider distance as well. So take, for example, sweet potatoes. Uh, between Vietnam and Japan. Vietnam is closest to Thailand, so it's likely to be sourced from uh, Vietnam rather than Japan. So what I'm trying to emphasize here is that not only th these companies are competing with other companies of similar products, but they are also competing with the consumers. I no longer produce, uh, uh, make this soup. I just purchase it because the quality is so good and I can't beat the price. And the other is the product of Thailand. It is no law, it is actually not a product of Thailand. It is a global product or at least an Asian product. That's another striking feature. And the amount of ingredients that go into making it. So there are hundreds, if not thousands of such products. Now, a figure such as the agricultural trilemma can be used to explain the relationship between food security, sustainability, and affordability in the home countries. That's where they are made and the consequences of that. So there are a large number of farmers involved uh, and they're all small scale farmers. Uh, another striking feature is that food production is dependent on government subsidies and also water uh, for example fertilizers 
right? And then uh, there is water. Uh, water is unpriced mostly. And uh, many other costs also remain unaccounted, like the health costs. So, and uh, this, there is food production happening, uh, but uh, it has created a false sense of security. One of the reasons is if you look at the sustainability aspects, it is very poor. Sustainability of agricultural land and resources take very low priority in these countries. Farmer health costs are also largely ignored. Future food production can only get worse if sustainability issues are neglected. So when it comes to uh, affordability, government subsidies and other uh, unaccounted costs keep uh, prices low in a closed economy for these countries for a close country consumers not paying the real cost of agricultural produce uh, production and subsidization has increased over the decades now if there are exports happening now because of uh, global food supply chains taking food out of these countries then what happens is then we have to look at winners and losers. Apart from the companies winning or gaining, consumers in foreign countries such as me and you all gain. Producers in home countries also gain. Let's not forget the subsidies. Uh, consumers in home countries are likely to see higher prices if exports are large. They also may have to pay back for the subsidies in the form of taxes. Uh, and uh, finally, farmer health costs remain unaccounted for. Agricultural biodiversity also remain unaccounted. And international trade also don't take these uh, costs into account. And with climate change, I would say then that these issues are some of the biggest threats to global food security and food supply chains. And with that note, I thank you once again. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Wilson. Thank you for your wonderful presentation on the involving trades in global agricultural trade and value chains. Your analysis of the impact of global value chain on major stakeholders within agricultural production is very perspective and eye-opening. Now, please let me invite our second panelist, Professor Richard Toll. Professor Richard Tov is a professor at the Department of Economic at the University of Sussex and a professor of the Economic of Climate Change at the Institute of Environmental Studies and Department of Special University, Varia University, Amsterdam, Netherlands. And Professor Tov is the author of Chapter 5 in Part 3 of the book. Navigating the energy dilemma during geopolitical and environmental crisis. Now, Professor Richard Tall, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you. It's an honor and pleasure to be here. Uh, I thought I was the third speaker. Um, there are two chapters in part three, uh, and I'm sorry to say that neither of them is on value chains. Uh, the first chapter is by my old friend, uh, Rob Elliott. <clears throat> um, and it looks at patenting as an indicator of innovation. Uh, that is a bit unfortunate uh, because patent, patents only cover, uh, of course, or mostly cover product innovation rather than process innovation. And if you look at, for instance, um, wind and solar power, most of the drop in costs uh, that we have witnessed over the last decade or so, last decades, I should say, uh, are due to better, smarter ways of producing these things rather than really smarter products. So it's a lot of process innovation going on, and it's mostly process innovation that is driving down the cost. Um, but uh, the authors focus on uh, 
patents and therefore on product innovation. Um, what they document is a sharp uh, increase over the last uh, couple of decades uh, in the number of patents that have been filed and granted. Uh, that phenomenon uh, is worldwide. They also document um, a market shift uh, from Europe and North America to particularly East Asia in the geographical uh, location of those patents being filed and granted. Um, <clears throat> they also document an increase in echo uh, innovation. Um, that is the type of innovations that would allow us to reduce pollution um, and reduce resource use. Uh, so that is uh, good news for those who care about the environment. Um, the problem with this sort of analysis is that it is fairly narrow, low, narrowly focused. Um, and if you look at, for instance, the uh, innovations, very rapid innovations that we've seen in electric vehicles, uh, that mostly comes from progress in battery technology. But that is actually not classified as an eco innovation that is because people started demanding better batteries for their laptops first and for their mobile phones later. And those sort of spillovers uh, get lost when you focus narrowly uh, on echo innovation, but they do uh, document an uptick in echo in, uh, innovation. Um, they also find an increase in uh, what they call collaborative uh, innovation, that is innovation uh, patents that are filed by multinational teams, um, which uh, is of course also uh, good um, in uh, general that people start looking uh, beyond their narrow circles um, and start working together. That can only drive up uh, the speed of innov innovation. Um, unfortunately, the book the, or the chapter does not cover uh, diffusion. I say uh, that is unfortunate. Um, essentially, we have all the technology that we need to bring CO2 down to zero. And what really matters is that people start using um, these technologies rather than that we have more of them. Of course, having more options would accelerate uh, the energy transition. Uh, but it's much more important that people start using uh, this. Um, there, um, there's also an international uh, dimension to the fusion, um, obviously. Um, it's been documented over and over again that uh, technology diffuses across borders, particularly in multinational companies uh, and along multinational value chains. Part of that is direct technology transfer. Uh, some of it is actually uh, embedded in equipment. Um, uh, and part of that is demanding um, more demanding standards from the eventual uh, customers of the products, but also uh, of the companies themselves that they put further uh, string, more stringent claims on uh, the companies that deliver stuff to them. Uh, and part of it is also simply economies of scale and scope that allow you to do things in a more research efficient uh, and cleaner uh, way. <clears throat> Unfortunately, we are now in the political situation uh, that this particular process of diffusion is threatened by geopolitical um, forces, particularly depending um, on the increasing uh, conflict between uh, the USA and uh, China. The uh, other chapter in this part uh, was written by uh, me. It is on the energy uh, trilemma. The energy trilemma is much the same as Clevo's um, uh, agricultural uh, trilemma. That is, we want our energy to be affordable. We want it to be reliable and we want it to be clean. Um, and it's fairly easy to do one of these three things. Um, it's sometimes easy to do two of the three, uh, but it's almost never easy to meet all three goals at the same time. Um, unfortunately, in the literature, uh, some people combine uh, affordability and reliability and call that energy security. And um, some other people even add uh, clean energy to the mix. I think that just obscures uh, the trade-offs. Uh, I don't think you can get any insight by calling different things by the same name. I think that just causes confusion. Uh, so I think we should just keep them uh, separate. 
Um, the big problem with um, fossil fuels is that they are very concentrated uh, geographically uh, in their uh, location of exploitation. Um, and of course, there's also, um, partly as a result of that, uh, bottlenecks in transport. Uh, and that makes fossil fuels very vulnerable to uh, disruption that those that can be from uh, natural disasters or that can be from local conflicts uh, over those resources. Um, and of course, because the semi-monopoly rents uh, on fossil fuels are so very high, uh, that of course fuels conflicts over um, fuels conflicts over those uh, resources. Um, and then, of course, what we have seen time and time again over the last century or so uh, is that efforts to secure those sources of fossil fuels uh, often backfire and lead to further conflict um, and um, a further escalation uh, of the conflict rather than uh, calming down of tempers. Um, <clears throat> Um, these sort of conflicts uh, spill over uh, through markets. Um, one recent example is the second invasion uh, of Russia in Ukraine, um, which sent energy markets in Europe in a tizzy. Now, that was no problem for reliability of the energy supply in Europe, uh, because we just started buying uh, stuff at the world market and drove up prices. Uh, and what you see is that the real problems, what you saw is that the real problems of energy reliability and energy simply not being there popped up in places such, in, such as Pakistan, which really was far away from the conflict and had nothing uh, to do with it. Um, <clears throat> now, that is the big problem with fossil fuels. Uh, and it's an intrinsic problem uh, that follows from the uh, con geographical concentration of the resource. Uh, renewables do not have that problem. Uh, renewables are much more dispersed than fossil fuels are, uh, and therefore more reliable. This just follows from the law of large numbers. If you have more supplies, uh, then the chance that they all get disrupted at the same time is actually much smaller. Um, some people counter that particular argument by saying, oh, but rare earths that are necessary for uh, the renewables uh, and for batteries, are geographically concentrated and wouldn't that cause a problem? I don't think that is the case because these things are used for capacity expansion rather than for uh, the actual use. Uh, if there's no more oil, then your car will stop working. If there's no more lithium, your battery will still work. You just can't buy new batteries. And there's a big distinction and crucial distinction there. Um, for that reason, uh, climate policy improves reliability of the energy sector in the long run because it entails a switch to renewables. Um, but in the short run, that is not necessarily the case because we are looking at substantial amounts of standard assets and potential bankruptcies of companies that do no good to energy reliability. Um, a forced transition uh, to renewables uh, will also drive up the price uh, of energy uh, and therefore reduce the affordability definitely in the short run. In the long run, I think uh, market forces uh, will drive us to renewables anyway, because we see already that in some parts of the energy market, uh, renewables are simply the cheapest way of generating electricity uh, and renewables um, outcompete fossil fuels uh, and will do so in more market segments in the future. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Richard Thor. Thank you for taking time yeah, to present uh, at this webinar. Your uh, excellent presentation on the complexity of the energy trilemma, which is the affordability, reliability, and clean uh, during the geopolitical and the environmental crisis and the need to adapt to the changing landscape of energy resources and technologies. Give me a very deep impression. Thank you again, Professor Richard and Tao. Last but not least, let's invite our third
panelists today, Dr. Alicia Garcia Herrero, a chief economist of Asia Pacific Natisis in Hong Kong. And Dr. Alicia is the author of the chapter Resilience of Global Supply Chain, Facts and Implementations, which is in the part of the book, part four of our book. Dr. Alicia, now the floor is yours, please. Thank you. First of all, thank you very much for the invitation. I want to make sure you can hear me well. We can hear you. Okay. So uh, it's been a pleasure to collaborate in this book. Um, I, I think it's really a, a great addition uh, to our knowledge, global knowledge of supply chains. Uh, there is a wealth of questions that I hope the book can answer for policymakers. And, and this is something that is not going to stop with the book being published. As we can see from the unfortunate events in Israel, but also, of course, the war in Ukraine, let alone climate change or US-China strategic competition, supply chains are at the center of any of these considerations, whether it's commodities or oil, in the case of, of, of the most recent event, to more general um, commodities uh, or, or food, uh, as the first panelist discussed, uh, Mr. Wilson, or uh, let alone climate change, as we just heard. So I think the, the book will be widely read, and I want to congratulate ADBI for its efforts to put this book together. Um, and, and yes, uh, for uh, Sonobesan, I also think that this will contribute to a T20, T20, T7, and other types of think tank support to our policy making. So on that note, I'm going to share with you just a few slides, uh, which, uh, which basically summarize uh, the content of my chapter. Uh, in, in that chapter, I cover uh, a very important point, which is China's ascent from the periphery to the center of global value chains and what that means for the world. I also talk about resilience. Obviously, this is the, the title of the book and what uh, develop, developed economies are doing to increase the resilience of their supply chains um, and whether there is indeed already some reshuffling since the paper was written. I have to say that the reshuffling has only continued. Um, but I will not go through every graph because for the benefit of time, I want to focus only in, in on a few things. And the first one is, is clearly uh, quite astounding. Uh, China uh, is today 15% of, of a global export share but even more so uh, when we focus on capital goods. So it is clearly very central to supply chains. At the same time, supply chains are losing steam. This is quite important. This is, uh, to me, a very uh, obvious, uh, or at least clear, uh, this, is, this question is not obvious, so I should say, uh, a, a rather important piece in the puzzle of whether we are deglobalizing, globalizing, or still globalizing. This graph doesn't support the, the last view. It supports the view of at least globalization because the in, in integration of all countries globally in, in the supply chain is shrinking since the global financial crisis. And, and, and that contrasts indeed this increasing share of China in that very same case. If, if you want to know um, how this can be happening, the main answer is uh, China's uh, vertical integration, vertical integration. So if you look at the change, which is in these dotted points on the right hand side of the, China's domestic value added of exports, it's, it's just increasing faster than any country in the world, basically, or at least those that I am sur surveying in this paper. So this is partially, why this is happening is like countries are trying to increase their their um, value added domestically, and this is particularly the case of China. Uh, it, at the same time, uh, China is 
uh, reducing its uh, imports massively. We we know that for the last four months, import growth in China has been highly negative. In some cases, double digit negative. And here, this is a different type of data, I would say even more informative. When we look at the imports, uh, Chinese imports of intermediate goods for then to re-export from China, you can see in this dotted point on the left-hand side, a massive reduction uh, since 20, uh, from 2014 to 2018. Um, preliminary data, I'm now working with the updated version of, of Untak de Ora 2022, this is even bigger, much bigger. So this is the idea of, of basically self-reliance. And the other one is that China at the same time is exporting much more of these intermediate goods for the rest of the world to export. As you can see on the right hand side of the graph, uh, with a massive increase in the same time frame. Uh, so this is what I mean by vertical integration. Now the next question is resilience. Are we increasing resilience or are we not? Uh, well, uh, our degree of resilience, as uh, surely has been shown uh, by the events that I I did mention, is quite low. So. Part of our critical dependencies on China are on products that are not very uh, relevant, at least they're, they're easy to substitute, such as office machines or textile. That is not necessarily a big problem. However, when we go into transition, and this was the paper before, we look at solar panels. Uh, for example, China's manufacturing capacity is 85% of global capacity. And in the case of Europe, just to give you an example, we import over 90% of our solar panels from China. So that's a critical dependence. It's less the case for wind turbines, uh, is quite much the case for, um, for electric batteries. Of course, nobody says we want to delay decarbonization because of critical dependence. That, that's the idea of the risking that is in the air. But I think we need to think of how to decarbonize by still reducing dependence. And this is not so much because of fear of retaliation from China. It, it doesn't have to be negative. It, it is only a question of diversification. Is the risk of major event happening, uh, whether it's a climate, climate uh, shock or any other type of shock that would lead to a sudden stop in the delivery of such solar panels, et cetera, that would lead indeed to, to, to such a problem of, of delivery of sourcing, delaying our uh, uh, decarbonization. So, so we have to think in, in, in that way. I'm going to jump a few slides um, to say that, yes, indeed, this, is, this critical dependence is noted by our policymakers in the developed world. And frankly, already in India, we just had a, a anti-subsidy investigation launched by India. Uh, uh, so, so it is not only the developed world, but I, I am reporting on that because um, arguably it's the first step or the first, I mean, the countries that have moved faster in, in this idea of reducing dependences. So you have there a list of, you know, number of uh, legislation. Uh, I, I want to note that the first country legislation legislating is not the US, nor is it Europe, it's South Korea. Um, and that's uh, with the act on supporting the return of overseas Korean enterprises. So this this is actually long standing and it's, it's also an Asian issue. It's not only a US centric issue. Um, so I, I want to uh, finish by saying that um, beyond this, which is basically, you may say, a policy-driven force to diversify and to de-risk, uh, there are all pieces that companies are starting to look into to, to push diversification. And many are just simply cost of uh, critical dependence, whether it's a telecom dependence, whether it's data governa governance, uh, financial dependence, etc., so, standards. So there's a lot of reasons. I, I will finish now. Uh, Fifty seconds uh, for companies themselves to to be pushing for this, um, the risking, which is leading the the uh, reshuffling theme. And you can see basically just show you that. 
particular investment into Asia, China, and I think partially because there's this idea of, of diversifying and not putting all of the eggs in the same basket. Um, so to conclude, a global supply chains uh, were growing, they're not growing as much. Uh, this is a problem. If you look at you know how much trade has brought to the global economy in terms of growth, um, but at the same time we also need to realize that the main domestic level, uh, China is a bad example, but there are on top of that we see this policy driven force to reduce to increase resilience of supply chains and reduce um ex and themselves are reshuffling the uh, On that note, I think I'm five seconds away from my time. So I, I leave it here. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Alicia, for your fantastic presentation. Your presentation has addressed the complex factors influencing companies' decisions to shift their production shedding light on consideration of both business and governments and the needs of the corporation. Now, we have our three honorable uh, presenters already com uh, completed uh, their uh, discussion as panelists. To summarize the major points discussed by each panelist, I would like uh, yeah, to try to summarize. For Professor Wilson, he has discussed uh, three points. First is the increasing trade of global value chain GVCs in agricultural goods production, where multiple countries contribute to the production of final, ready to consume agricultural products. Second, the benefits and concerns about food security, sustainability, and affordability in countries where the intermediate goods are produced. Third, how these emerging trades connected with the agriculture dilemma and explores potential winners and losers in the context of GVCs in agriculture production. Professor Richard Toll's paper and speech give us a very deep impression of the following points. First is the increasing trade of innovation in clean technology, but what is more important in how to get people to use them. Second, the energy security should address the conflicting aspects of the energy trilemma, specifically the reliability, affordability, and the clean, which involved in trade-off. Third, the new climate policies and the transitions to renewables introduce challenges such as changing resource dependencies and how and low wind period. However, in the long run, fossil fuel will eventually fade out. And Dr. Alicia has discussed the PRC's central role in the global supply chains is facing challenges driven by geopolitical events and economic effects. And disruption has caused the supply chain damage and leading to food and fuel inflation affecting the household and businesses. Third, the developed nations are strengthening supply chain resilience through legislation, pushing companies to diversity and shift towards the decarbonization. I'm not sure if my summarize is uh, quite correct. So please, uh, now let's move to the next session. The next session is uh, uh, the Q&A session from the audience. If you have uh, questions, please use the raise hand tool on the uh, Zoom and also remind us with your name, organization, and to whom you are heading your question to. Thank you. Now let's look at the Q and A. Do we, do we have any people to ask questions? Since I haven't found any questions here, I would like to take the my responsibility as a moderator to ask questions first. So I have questions to three of our panelists. Uh, first question 
for Professor Wilson, how can policymakers and business address the potential shortcomings and concerns associated with this trade in global agriculture value chain while preserving its positive aspects? Am I clear on the question? Yes. Thank yes. you. Thank you, Professor Wilson, please. Yes. Thank you. Uh, it, it's, it's very complex, right? Uh, from what I see, global value chains are sucking food from some of these Asian countries to uh, more rich countries, right? Uh, and a, at a price that is insane. And most of the, the, the prices that we pay really don't reflect the true cost of producing these goods. Some producers gain in these countries, in these home countries, uh, but uh, there is a huge environmental penalty and there is a huge subsidy, which is subsidized by, uh, by uh, governments, uh, those who can even afford, right? Uh, and that's, and, but home consumers as a result, because of a lot of goods, agricultural moving out of the country, now they will have to pay a higher price. They are already paying that, right? So foreign countries, uh, consumers in foreign countries are the beneficiaries. So now stopping exports is not the solution to this, right? Some governments such as India have done that because of the Ukrainian crisis. Um, I would say an export tariff to some extent would go a long way uh, because uh, then it can cover some of the subsidies and at least some of it would remain in the, the money would remain in the, come back to the country. Because at the moment, the balance of trade for these countries is not necessarily improving just because they are exporting. Even, and, and they're exporting at a huge, with a huge subsidy. And this is where the dilemma is. And it's very unfortunate and we don't see that and governments don't see that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Wilson. Uh, now I found there are some uh, colleagues raise their hands. Diosa, you have questions first and then second, Dina. So Diosa, please ask your questions. Thank you very thank much, you. Uh, Yijing-san. Uh, thank you all. Thanks to all the panelists. I think uh, we are very grateful that we have such an enlightened uh, Panelist here. My question, first question, is to 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 Professor Wilson. Uh, like uh, as we have been discussing, that uh, that we really need to internalize the the cost. And some have been talking that we move subsidy from environmentally unsustainable uh, subsidy to environmentally sustainable subsidy. But uh, but then, like if we really have to internalize all the costs, then the cost of food increases. Right, even like uh, at current level, people are complaining that there is a higher inflation of food. But if we have to really internalize all those costs, uh, how would we handle the havoc? Although I mean, like now, if you look at it, it's, it's the poor developing country who exports those unprocessed food and is processed and being exported to developed countries. Uh, these poor developing countries are subsidizing the 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 developed countries but then like if we have to change the dynamics how it would look that's one uh, questions to professor clevo and also to to professor tall uh, like you know as you know like uh, professor wilson had shown that uh, that uh, when we when we move goods we try when we import we try to look at the distance right uh, so that we minimize the cost not only the cost we minimize the use of energy right so energy plays a very important role when it comes to the trade so, so what would be your like, you know, as an energy expert, what would you suggest uh, to 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 minimize the energy use when we move goods from one place to another place? Thank you, Diosa. Now, first, uh, so Wilson, Professor Wilson, would you like to answer the Diosa's question briefly? Second, we will ask uh, uh, Professor Richard Tao to answer the second question. Thank you. So deal, uh, internalizing market failures in these countries, or in fact, even in the developed world, is extremely difficult. Um, so, uh, I mean, uh, um, farmers in the, the, the farmers are lobbies, right? There are thousands and millions of small scale farmers. Uh, and if there is going to be a price put on 
right, or, or subsidies are reduced, they are going to fight back. Uh, and uh, because of that, there is a lock-in situation because they have got so used uh, to uh, subsidies such as fertilizer and water, right? So this is where the dilemma is. And uh, in any case, uh, I mean, of course, governments think they're doing the right thing. Uh, but at the end, farmers benefit a little, home consumers actually lose out, and the winners are the, uh, the, the consumers in rich countries who continue to suck the remaining resources that are there in these poor countries. So that's why I say you start with an export tariff, potentially, right? Rather than giving it so free to these countries. And I'm surprised to see the sachet of soup for a dollar and 69 cents, which one and a half people can consume, right? And even the breakfast I eat, right, is about $3 and which I can eat for a week. And while the food prices in these home countries are going up. So it's a very complex issue uh, to address uh, and almost seemingly uh, impossible uh, be talking to policymakers in some of these countries. Thank you. So that's, yeah. Oh, yeah, thank you, Wilson. Thank you, Professor Wilson. Now, Professor Tho. Richard Ho, would you like to answer the second question from the author? Thank you. Yeah, I'm afraid I do not understand the question. Uh, I think it reflects uh, sort of eco-mercantilism. Um, <clears throat> there is a strong undertone uh, in the environmental movement against international trade and for protectionism. Uh, I think that is utterly wrong. Uh, the aim is to maximize welfare, not to minimize energy use. Uh, what we should do is price the externalities that are caused by the energy use in transport, but not uh, forbid transport or international trade. I think that is a route that is utterly uh, mistaken. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Tho. Uh, Dio san, are you satisfied? <laughs> Okay, thank you, dear son. For interest of time, actually, our professors answered very briefly. Then I would like to invite Dina. Dina is my thank colleague. Thank you very much. Yeah, Please ask um, question. my question related. So, what Alicia showed us a nice graph showing that most of solar panels coming from China, and she said that uh, we need to diversify suppliers. Like COVID happened, we had disruption in supply. Uh, another message what I want to add that many countries trying to diversify by produce by promoting local production, right? Because if you have locally produced solar panels, wind turbines, then government can more likely to provide subsidies like feed-in tariffs and other subsidies to encourage uh, local installations of solar panels because they know that money will stay in country, uh, produce like generating employment, you know, like income rather than uh, going money going abroad. So they more likely. However, countries were trying to do this, uh, promote local production, and many countries just failed. Even they had this local content requirement, like if you want to get feed and tariff, buy our local solar panels. So they did it in some countries, but some countries failed, some countries still exist. Like in my country, they did it until the company just shut down, the, the local production just shut down. Uh, they were trying to promote. So do you have any suggestions like how to this promote uh, local production or do we need it? Maybe we don't need it. <laughs> Maybe it should be large scale. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dina. Now, Prof. Uh, Dr. Alicia. Yeah. yeah. Yes, Please. so I'll Thank be brief because I need to jump to another call, but, and I know we are done with our time, but, um, I wanted to say that we've actually written a policy uh, proposal, which we will be presenting this a little bit publicity. Sorry about that, but it 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 helps me answer the question because I cannot answer it all in a minute. Uh, we'll be presenting this proposal at Bruegel on the 25th of October, so you can find the information there for the seminar. But in a nutshell, the proposal is actually a decarbonization partnership. The idea being that uh, reshoring production, uh, I hope that Richard agrees because he's the expert here, but to me it makes no 
sense for ha to have every country in the world producing tiny bits of, of you know of their solar panels at a huge cost. Uh, even the as with ARA is just too expensive. So I think the idea supplementary, not the substitute, the supplementary supply chain, exactly to, for, first of all, uh, to avoid technological dependence that we are stuck with one technology rather than, you know, uh, because we only have, in essence, a supply chain. And uh, secondly, because in any event, and we've made calculations for this, uh, the amount of renewables needed for the world to decarbonize is so humongous that it's just too risky to have 90% of global solar panels in one country. So, so we are making this proposal of a, a decarbonization partnership and the details as to how this uh, partnership would uh, work are in this policy brief that will be published on the 25th of October. That's all from my side. Thank you very much, Alicia. Thank you, everyone, for your valuable questions. And uh, thank you to our three honorable uh, panelists to uh, answer the questions briefly. But for interest of time, I understand yeah, you already explained a lot of things in your paper. And uh, we still have a lot of uh, questions uh, need to be solved in the future. Now, as our webinar is approaching to the end, uh, yeah. We would like to invite John Bayer, Vice Chair of Research Department and the Senior Research Fellow at the ADBI to give us a uh, closing remarks. John, please. John. Thank you, yeah. Yishin. Thank you, yes, I will just be brief uh, given the time. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank all of the contributors to this uh, book. I think we have produced a very nice output um, across sectors and highlighting um, not only um, how to improve resilience, but also looking forward how to address the risks uh, in supply chains in that regard. I think that when we embarked on this project uh, in early 2022, we of course knew that COVID was having uh, some impact on uh, you know, supply chains, but those impacts were basically repairing around that time at the start of 2022. Then, of course, we had the situation with uh, Russia and Ukraine, which we knew was going to um, negate those improvements that had been underway in the in the in what was the post-pandemic period. So we embarked on this project as a result of that. Um, as was stated at the beginning of, of the uh, talk today, we found some difficulty in getting speakers, or sorry, not, not speakers, but uh, paper writers uh, for this particular topic. Um, obviously, before the pandemic, everybody knew about the benefits of, you know, increasing global value chain participation for economies in terms of output, in terms of job creation and so on. But we knew very little about the vulnerabilities that we faced in global supply chains um, and the impacts that they would have. I think that, you know, the book published today sheds light on the uh, those concentration risks that need to be addressed. I very much agree with the point of Alicia just made uh, a few minutes ago that, you know, issues around friend shoring and near shoring are not likely to be longer term solutions. Um, you know, what's really needed is broader diversification. Friend shoring can, in a way, and increase the concentration risks, which is not what we want. Um, I think that you know, one of the learning points from the book was that we need to be aiming to um, move economies up the value chain by involving more economies in that value chain uh, through targeted investment in key sectors. And this will help to uh, enhance the resilience of, of economies to these types of major external shocks that we have experienced in, in recent years. That said, there are, of course, uh, still risks ahead related to, you know, ongoing cost of living pressures and ongoing geopolitical uncertainty. As well as that, we have to um, you know, bear in mind the impact that climate risk can have on uh, the supply chain and um, you know, the need for effective policies, particularly on a multilateral uh, basis to, to address many of those risks. But you know, I will stop talking here at this point. Um, once again, Thank you to all of the paper writers, chapter authors. Thank you to the other co-editors of this book um, for a very timely uh, output. And 
which was produced in a, in a very uh, timely manner as well. And um, yes, as I said, we have learned a lot, but I think that uh, there are risks ahead which we need to be uh, very wary of. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John, for your very brief but uh, impressive yeah, closing remarks. Now our webinar has come to the end. As we conclude uh, this book launch event, I want to express my heartfelt thanks to all of you, all of the contributors of the book, panelists and active audience for making this book launch uh, reasonable. And I, I I'm forgetful, <laughs> successful event. And lastly, I would like to uh, draw your attention to don't forget to download the book from our website. And uh, it was put on the website just uh, several hours before our, this book launch. And then thank you and have a great